All right, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I'm really excited to kick us off tonight. I think we've got a great lineup for you. Um, and we're gonna start just by talking a bit about prototyping in general. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to give a bit of background on myself. Uh, so I have a bit of a mixed background. I actually went to UC Berkeley, right across the bay, where I studied computer science. Go Bears, if there's any alumni in the house. Um, and I actually studied computer science because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I thought that if I studied CS, it would probably be helpful, like no matter what I ended up doing in the future. And so while studying CS, I realized that I was really interested in design and user experience and the human-centered side of things. And so I'm currently a designer at Pinterest. Um, and I work on activation and growth, so primarily thinking about our new users and people who are lower engaged and helping them better understand how we can help them understand Pinterest um, and how Pinterest can help them. So in between these spheres of computer science and design, there's kind of this sweet spot in the middle and that's where prototyping tends to live, I think. It can often bridge the gap between the two. Um, and that's why I like to do a lot of work here. And so at Pinterest, I also love teaching. So I teach a workshop. Um, I teach other designers how to design with, print, print, design with Framer, um, but also an introduction to programming and prototyping in general. And so in December, I ran a workshop which was split into two tracks, an intro to Framer and more with Framer. And the first two days were focused on kind of getting people settled in, introducing programming, building some examples together. And the later two days are focused on a more advanced set of skills. Uh, so be, be, being able to expand, build things that were maybe a bit more complex, and even pulling in things like real data. So if you're interested in learning how to teach Framer at your company, or if you're just interested in kind of stepping up your Framer skills, I'm actually working on releasing my complete curriculum with Framer in a blog post, probably coming out next week. Uh, so keep an eye out for that, and I'd love to hear your feedback on maybe how it might help you learn. But today we're actually going to talk a bit about prototyping principles. And so this is something that I like to teach in my workshop as well. I like to start people off with a basis of not just how to build things, but why and how you can be more effective in doing so. And so we'll talk about a couple of principles and how they can help you in your workflow. The first is just to prioritize speed. And I think this is often the most obvious. Um, but really, prototyping is a form of problem solving. And so you want to get to a solution to your problem as soon as possible. And really, you want to do that so it frees you up to solve more problems later on. And so we'll keep this one in mind as we talk about the other principles. The second principle is to pick your tools wisely. Um, and I think this one is often kind of tricky when maybe you're only familiar with a couple where there's a lot out there. But the key is to remember that every tool actually has its superpower. So there's something that that tool is very good at and is very effective at. And it also has its kryptonite. Uh, so this is the face you might make when you're like two hours into building something and you realize it's just not going to work. Like either it's taking way too long and you could have done it with something else much quicker and solve your problem fine. Um, or it just like won't work at all. Like the tool actually doesn't have the capability that you need and you didn't know that starting out. So you wanna avoid this like as much as possible. And if we look at kind of the tools that are available today, like this doesn't even begin to cover it. There's way more than this. And it's quite exciting that people recognize that we need more tools that are better suited for our workflow. But it can also be pretty overwhelming. Like, if you're not familiar with a lot, a lot of these and you want to you know, pick up a new skill set, it's confusing to know where to start. And so people, I think, often make the mistake of assuming that things are very interchangeable um, or that they're all basically the same. Uh, but really, they tend to fall into like, a some sort of order um, in terms of just the capabilities they offer you and how effective they are in solving certain types of problems. So we'll look at kind of what these break down into. So starting with just the simplest, like paper and pencil, and I put Keynote, I think are good at kind of, you can solve visual problems with them. They're not particularly detailed at solving the visual problems, like you can't really spec things. But the main drawback, or the kryptonite, is that they're not interactive. Um, and when designing digital products, that's like a huge, huge disadvantage. And so moving into kind of other types of tools, I have the stars as kind of the little superpowers. You'll have Sketch and Figma, which are known for doing very specific like spec work and visual design. They also allow you to do tap flows, which is great if you want to keep the same tool. And then Envision, which is perhaps better known for making tap prototypes, but is now branching into visual design. And then you have tools like 
Flinto or Principle, or there's a lot of others where you can start to make very detailed micro interactions that feel very high fidelity, but can often be pretty quick to make. And so kind of our last section here ends up being more of our heavy hitters category. And so you'll see that they allow you to do a lot more, including complex logic and pulling in real data, but they also like still let you do tap flows and micro interactions. And the last column is actually production code. And so I put Xcode up there, which is what you'd use to build an iOS app. It's what your engineers will use. But really any tool that your engineer actually uses for production um, is something that you could prototype in. Uh, often there's a drawback where it's very slow for other things, but if you need something one-to-one -one and you want to make that handoff process easier, like that is probably the most effective way to do it. And so people are still like, okay, there's still a lot of tools. What tool should I use? Um, like, should I just pick up one? But it's really not really about what tool you want to use. It's about when you want to use each tool. So if you think about like, when should I use something like Sketch? You can like be like, okay, the superpowers, it's really good for solving visual problems. And maybe I also need to, need to do a simple tap flow. That'll be the quickest way for me to solve that problem. And when should I use something like Principle? And you'll see that I can do very specific micro interactions, but I can also have tap flows. So you can build something that feels a bit higher fidelity and it's pretty fast for that. And then we get into like, when should I use Framer? Um, and I think this is often confusing for a lot of people because if you're not familiar with it, you're like, why would I use this when I can use something that's perhaps a bit quicker that I'm already familiar with? And a Framer you'll see can actually do a lot of stuff. And so we'll focus on kind of the superpower area where I think it's often not as clear why you'd use this. So let's say I have a problem. I need to evaluate something that's really, really interactive. So I work on onboarding a lot, um, and I work on topic pickers. And so for topic pickers, you can select anything you want in there, right? And so if I want to make something that actually has that capability, there's not a ton of possibilities. Like, I could try using principle, um, but it ends up being like very, very manual. I would have to go in and actually select every tile and then add an interactive capability to it. And I'm just not gonna do that for like 100 topic tiles. Like I could, but then if I make the prototype and decide I wanna change something, it ends up being a lot harder to do that. And so perhaps I'll actually use Framer and I'll use loops in Framer. And so this is an example of a project I worked on where I dynamically generated everything you see with code. So none of it is like imported or made in a visual design editor. And you'll see that as you like tap them, we have kind of related pins come up in the background and I'm actually pulling in random images because I'm just evaluating the interaction here. The content doesn't really matter. And once I have this base prototype, I can end up building on it and iterating really, really quickly. So here I changed the background to be three columns instead of two. Um, I can kind of change the scrolling to see if maybe that feels better. And then I can even do something maybe a bit more complex where I have kind of a draggable bottom tray. So you can toggle between a more interactive experience. And then maybe you can actually go back and look at the pins in the background as well. And so beyond that, like if I decide I want to strip out the images, I don't have to hook everything up by hand again. And so I can do a lot of text variants. The background doesn't show up great here. But you'll see that this ends up being kind of a lot of different examples of how I can build on top of this without starting completely over. And so out of all the examples I showed you, that ends up being like less than half of everything I explored for this project. And they end up coming really, really quick, like once I have that base prototype built. So another problem, let's say I really need the content to feel real. So we were using random images before because I wasn't really, that wasn't really my problem. Um, but maybe I do need something where I want it to feel like a real experience. And so I could handpick images, uh, but again, that's gonna take a while. And so I can use Framer with data. So this one actually pulls in the related pins of each pin up above and it creates a loop that feels pretty much the same as you would have in an actual browsing experience in the app. And so by building this, I can actually build on top of this whenever I want to design using the surface, and it ends up being way quicker than doing something in production or doing something that doesn't feel real at all. And a third problem, let's say now, I want to test this idea with real people and see what they think. And so let's say you have like 10 people coming in in person to the office to do a user testing session. And again, like you could handpick content, but you'd have to handpick it for each person because they're each different and maybe they're interested in different things. Or you could pick a generic set of content and you can kind of make them pretend that they're interested in it. 
Uh, so you can be like, pretend these are your pins or these are your boards or you're actually interested in food and drink or something. Um, and I find that that introduces a lot of gaps in your actual testing process. And so instead, we can use Framer with data and do some qual with it as well. And so here's an example of as I change the name of my board on the bottom, you'll see that it generates pins that are actually on my public boards and pull them in one by one. And so you can imagine how this scales when you bring people in for user testing, you can get their permission, access some of their public pins, test your designs in a way that makes them feel really real for them, and uncover a lot of issues that you might not have found otherwise. And for tools that are on like the far side of the spectrum, I put Xcode up there earlier. There's also things like CSS and JavaScript, just whatever your engineer will actually use in production. I find that these are the most helpful when you need to make a really specific animation. Um, so one possibility is you make something in After Effects, like it looks like how you want it to look, but it's not interactive. Maybe you make something with another prototyping tool like Principle, uh, but again, like your engineer doesn't actually know how to implement it to have it match that completely. And so at this point, there ends up being a lot of back and forth, and you often end up relying on interpretive dance as a prototyping tool. And I think the superpower is def definitely that it's really entertaining. Um, but the kryptonite is like, they still don't know what values to plug in, right? They don't know how to make it exactly how you would like it. And so instead, you can use like, something like CSS if it's for web, um, if it's for mobile, using the compatible technology for that, and just have the exact curves and timing that they need. So an example is kind of I worked on this prototype, which is a pulsar. But basically, it's interactive. It's built actually in like the same technology my engineer would use. And then I can hand off a code snippet. So that handoff process is a lot quicker. And we don't have that back and forth or any dancing. So people, people often ask, like, why would I learn a new tool when it's just going to take so much time? Like, doesn't this introduce a lot of tension with our first principle, which is to prioritize speed? And honestly, it just depends on the tool. And so if we look at the tools kind of on the left side of the spectrum, they end up being pretty quick and easy to learn. So anything that doesn't introduce complex logic, you can pick up like pretty easily, I would say. And that's great. You can solve problems that do anything from micro interactions to visuals, and you can do it fast and effectively. But if you're working on problems that need something more complex, and need to be higher fidelity, or even need data, although that may be rare, uh, then you'll want to know a tool like Origami or Framer, um, because it'll just help you solve more problems. So like an example of kind of a toolkit that maybe would be useful for a lot of people in this room is you always start with sketching, you solve your visual problems in something like Sketch that lets you spec things. Maybe you do some tap flows there. You use principle for things that you need to build quickly that involve micro interactions. And then you have a tool like Framer that allows you to do complex logic and pull in data. And then maybe if you like, then you can pick up something like CSS or something if you do a lot of web prototyping. So you can make that handoff process easier. So it's all about just knowing when to use the right tool. And honestly, like the time you invest in learning will actually make the time you save later on. So it's okay if it takes a bit longer at the beginning, it'll be worth it in the end. So our third principle is actually just to always be prototyping. And so this is if we look at kind of a product cycle of fidelity over time. Usually like you start out and you don't really know what you're doing and it takes a while to get to a higher point of fidelity. And then you'll do the same thing as you start talking to your engineers and try to make this thing a reality. And then it happens again, like even as your engineers build on it later. And so ideally, if you prototype, it ends up being a stepping stone that gets you to a higher point in fidelity at an earlier point in time. And so this means that like, you'll do it as you design, which I think most companies do. You'll do it a bit later when like, you start talking to your engineers and making that handoff process better. And then even your engineers will do it later to figure out like, the faster way to build this thing more effectively. And so even if like, the designer isn't doing the prototyping, it should always be a mindset that's kind of there in the company and that everyone is aware of. So when people talk about prototyping is part of the process, I think it's really that prototyping is the process. Like you always want to be remembering these principles and implementing them in your workflow. And so just to recap, just remember that speed is always everything. 
although sometimes it's worth slowing down a little to pick up a skill that'll make you faster in the long run. Uh, knowing how to pick your tools wisely for the problems you're solving and having a couple different ones with different superpowers is the key. And then to just kind of spread the mindset to your entire team that you should always be prototyping. That's it. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Amit Pataru, who I worked with at 53, who taught me a lot of what I know, and Long Cheng for notes on this talk.